Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ISSA Los Angeles July chapter meeting. We're very happy that you could join us today. And we're really pleased to have an incredibly special guest joining us today. And I'd like to just share a few things about who we are here in Los Angeles. Uh, we're the founding chapter of ISSA International. I don't know how many of you were aware of that. And of course, our goal is to uh, allow you to do better things in your security programs and to educate our community so we can all practice CIA. And I don't mean the Washington version of that. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to an incredible group of volunteers who spend oodles of time of their private life devoting to ISSA and to the community and to all of us. So a big thank you to everyone listed here. Uh, it helps make ISSA uh, one of the leaders in the Southern California community. Um, you can join that community if you'd like. We have lots of great discussions. Uh, you can receive notifications for future meetings such as this and events and trainings and hopefully one day come meet with us in person again. All you got to do is go to issala.org and there'll be a, a way to connect with us. So please stay connected with your fellow InfoSec peers. A uh, shout out to our partners who have helped uh, arrange special discounts for us and our community. We'd like to thank Wombat and the Linux Foundation, Cybersecurity Collaborative, and the Linux Training Academy. If you've got a company that wants to give back, please contact us and let us know. And we've got our presence on all the, the big um, social media areas. Uh, of course, we can't hit every one of them. And uh, please join us. If you are uh, 30 and above, there is Facebook and there's Instagram for the rest of you. And we are on Meetup and Twitter and LinkedIn. So please join the community and join the discussions and uh, stay connected with us. Uh, we're really pleased to have another bearded wonder, Jack Daniel, come in to join us on our next month's meeting. How about that back-to-back -back Chris Roberts and Jack Daniel? Is that an incredible? People are just so nice to us during sequestration. It almost makes it worth to be locked up in our home. So a big <laughs> thanks to both of you gentlemen. You'll be hearing from Chris shortly. In September, we've got a diversity panel with Anu Kashi, Marcy McCarthy, Deidre Diamond, Jimmy Saunders, and Marie Galloway. These are all leaders in the field, and uh, we look forward to hearing what they're going to bring, talk about a very relevant and important topic in the field of InfoSec and technology. So we're looking forward to that very much. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Jack. Um, I'm sure that you're all, I'm sorry, Chris, yeah, I'm jumping ahead of myself, Chris. Um, He's got more gray than I have. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to... Um, just basically tell you that uh, he's been a, a, a great uh, contributor to the field. Um, he's considered one of the world's foremost experts on counter threat intelligence and vulnerability research within the information security industry. Um, he's currently serving as a virtual CISO uh, and advisor for a number of entities and organizations around the globe. Uh, his most recent projects are focused within deception, identity, cryptography, artificial intelligence, and service space. And he really does AI. As one of the well-known hackers and researchers, Chris is routinely invited to speak at industry conferences, CNN, The Washington Post, Wired, Business Insider, USA Today, Forbes, Newsweek, BBC News, Wall Street <laughs> Journal, and numerous others have covered him <laughs> in the media. Well done, Chris. Um, the BBC is always the interesting one because then my mother calls me up and goes, Christopher, did you break something again? Because we asked mother. <laughs> yeah, well, one, one more paragraph for you, Chris. I'm going to tell you. Oh. We got more. <laughs> we got more. Okay, the worst case, to jog your memory, Chris was the researcher who gained global attention in 2015. Uh, I can't believe it was five years ago. For demonstrating the linkage between various aviation systems both on the ground and while in the air that allowed the exploitation of attacks against flight control systems. Well put. So Chris, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I'm really happy to have you aboard. Thank you very much. No, thanks for having us, Rich and uh, Josh. Much appreciated for setting this up. All right, so uh, 
I'll actually get the, the screen started so that I don't goof the whole bloody thing up. Let's just do that quickly. Uh, desktop one. All right, so we did that work? The host has spotlighted you. The desktop one share or not? Oh, you are sharing. All right, so let's just make sure that this actually works how it should work. All right, you guys seeing the single desktop? Richard, you guys seeing the single desktop? Yeah, you're up. Go for it. Is it working? Yes, indeed, my lad. All right, splendid. I love it when some tech actually works. It's actually rather nice for a change. So um, thanks for having me, and uh, fantastic to be hanging out with the ISSA crew. Um, it, it, you know, it's, uh, it's that mixed blessing. It's really nice to be doing this, but it would be even nicer to be hanging out uh, out on the West Coast with everybody physically, but um, it is what it is. <coughs> so without further ado, we have a bit of a conversation about uh, about voting systems and voting voting machines and and the entire you know as timely as it is given the fact that we're uh, rapidly approaching uh, what is it November and everybody's stuck in their ballots in and all that shenanigans. So uh, we're gonna have a conversation generally about the voting system. But we're also gonna wind in and weave in a whole bunch of stuff to do with us and our industry and some things that we probably need to be thinking about and be cognizant about. So without further ado, obviously, uh, you know, we all know the, the origins, the vote for the none of the above on this one and uh, the wonders of maybe how we should be voting this year with all the shenanigans that's going on. Uh, general intro, uh, she gave me a very, very nice and very, very civilized intro, obviously researcher, father to a couple of worth months, uh, crazy geek and obviously hacker in the, the positive sense of that word. Um, we are gonna have a little bit of a public service announcement and uh, I'm gonna put a disclaimer with this one for the voting side of things. So um, I don't have any skin in the game on this one. Um, I'm obviously, you know, the accent kind of gives me a way that I'm not from this general neck of the woods. Um, you know, it's your country. Uh, we kind of gave it back to you a couple of hundred years ago and uh, you kind of screwed up a few things. So we probably need to have a conversation around the voting and around a few other bits and pieces. Um, we tried a few other times and uh, we really don't have much of a leg to stand on given we have the fun and games with Brexit. And um, from my standpoint, a lot of the voting conversations is really about a fair fight, which I would argue we really don't have at the moment because of those that actually hold the control over those systems. And uh, for those of you that are looking for a nice, feel good, friendly, civilized and wonderful one, uh, this is not going to be it. There's going to be some blunt statements about us and some other things in this one. So with that squirrel moment over, let's have a conversation about the now and where are we and what is going on. So back in 2019, when we were looking at the, this state of the voting and what is going on, there are a number of senators who actually for a change we agree with, which basically said the integrity of our election systems is obviously tied to the machines. And here's the challenge on this one, despite the responsibility and despite the limited number of players in the election system itself, um, the, in, the actual industry itself and the organizations that they represent really are not stepping up and uh, I guess holding themselves accountable for the very votes that they should be protecting. We'll get into the whys and wherefores on this one. For those of you who can still see my screen, one of my wolf mutts just decided to say hi as well. This is Milo. Hello, Milo. So let's take a little step back for a second and talk about our industry and what we are doing, what we should be doing. And, you know, it's all very well throwing rocks in uh, at other people, but uh, we should probably take a little bit of a look at ourselves first. So, you know, yes, we've got COVID and yes, it's wonderful, but let's be perfectly honest. Business is unfortunately booming for most of us. Um, having, doing a bunch of work in the MSP and MSSP space and a lot of it in the insurance and risk space. Unfortunately, it is a crazy amount of attacks going on. Small to medium businesses are getting hit, manufacturing is getting hit, and we are spending more and more and more money on this damn environment. Um, I think last year, we ended up spending about $124 billion. Now this year, it's gonna be all over the place. Uh, obviously, COVID's kind of messed a lot of things up. It's definitely changed a lot of priorities. Uh, you know, we have a much more scattered workforce and our focuses have obviously had to change. So it's going to be interesting to see where we end up. But the other two on this one is if you look at basically the security budgets increasing, how much um, the presidential budgets increasing, how much they're putting aside, we are spending a ton of money on this. So obviously, if we're spending a lot of money, 
we must actually be having some amazing, you know, some, some great results and some fantastic times. And we must be doing a lot, which unfortunately, let's face it, we're not. We suck. You look at cybercrime, the damage as it's spared. So that's a global number, six trillion. That from a GDPR spend puts cybercrime as one of the top countries in the world. And yet we spend 124 billion on this. And we break those statistics down a little bit further. It gets even kind of gloomier to be perfectly obvious. Uh, Ponymon and the FBI are all over the place. Um, if you take it, one of them says 150 days, somebody says 100 days. If you're Yahoo or a couple of the other companies out there, it's you know several thousand days. But the global average at the moment to identify the simple fact that you've had your ass handed to you, 197 days. When you've eventually figured out that your ass has actually been handed to you, it takes you another 70 days to work out what you actually need to do about it. And then we look at the phishing attacks and the average cost of a breach. The stat that really kind of pisses me off is how much data we are losing on a daily basis. That's 22 and a half million records. And again, global stats. So this is personal information, personally identifiable information, healthcare information, credit card data, social security, OPM data, you name it, it's all getting out there. It's ridiculous. And then statistically, you've got a one in three chance of being breached in the next two years. And so we have unfortunately not done a very good job of protecting the very charges that we have. And then we take a look at um, the top of breaches global. So top 30 breaches account for almost double the Earth's population. And this is how much data is out there. And this is how much information is out there. And so when we take a look at us, it's like, okay, you know, we really do need to take a step back and wonder how we are dealing with data and how we are handling it and how we are managing it. Again, ties into the voting system, but ties into security as a whole. Then, you know, in our failures, in the ways we've actually screwed up, we actually still somehow or other managed to make a profit because we've screwed up badly enough that the firewall, IDS, IPS, DLP, HIDS, and everything else, and I don't care which damn vendor you work for, it's not doing its job. Because if it was, we wouldn't have a wonderful industry in basically paying ransomware payments. You can go onto the internet and you can find a nice provider that's gonna help you pay your ransomware because we failed to actually protect you or we failed to educate you effectively. So when we take a step back and we look at the State of the Union, this is really about the State of the Union. Now, all of the vendors and all the people out there will be beating their chests at the moment and going, well, we've got cyber. Cyber will fix everything. And if my answer to that one is kind of a simple one, we take a look at the adversarial perspective. So the attacker, that person that is on the other side of your wall, actually, they're probably already inside your ready firewall, but it is what it is. Here's where the challenges start. From an adversarial standpoint, typically, they have more available Lithium tools. They're more time. There is more patience. And a lot of it is the collaboration. So if I need to attack you, I will use maybe something from the former Soviet Union in the command and control center. I'll pull my extracts out from say, maybe South America. If I'm doing the financial stuff, I'll run it through Eastern Europe. If I'm doing other kinds of attack, I'll run it through Germany or just the US. And in each one of these, I can buy, sell or trade the exploits I need, the frameworks I need and everything else. I have an amazing capability to collaborate among thieves, let's be perfectly honest, which is kind of where we take a look at this one. And then we have to take a look at what we are ranged against. So those very systems that you are sitting on that are meant to be protecting us. And again, take a look at the voting systems. Um, this was a capture of the flag that was done at the beginning of this year and the last year, beginning of this year. Full virtual machine, full Windows 10 platform. Um, both of the objectives were known, both of the systems were known. And, in all, and once we actually understood what we were looking at, 68 seconds to do both to break through them all. I was on a security shit show podcast that we do on a Thursday night with Ryan and Evan. And Ryan made mention that there was a report that was put out recently about consumer grade firewalls and um, the uh, cable, endpoint cable devices that we put in our, all of our homes. And I can't remember the exact numbers, either 120 or 140 of these devices were found 
to be sitting on the shelves, brand spanking new, all with vulnerabilities in them. So we're selling stuff to end consumers and people that already has a vulnerability in it. So it kind of sucks, you know, which goes back to, you know, Norton can't protect us. Now we look at the defenders. Where are we? You know, we're sitting there inside of our non-existent perimeter wondering what the hell we need to do. So we have tools. We have lots of tools, but they don't actually work well together half the damn time. Or we keep buying point solutions because while well, the industry tells us all you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven thousand vendors in the industry are each telling us they can solve the damn problem. And unfortunately, the technologies don't necessarily coexist effectively together. We have to spend more time justifying it, obviously, with policies, procedures, and controls that we are not effectively integrating or managing. We have frameworks, but we don't necessarily use them. And we're doing it with less resources because, you know, arguably, we are not doing a good enough job to help the industry understand what people are needs to bring in. This isn't a shortage issue. This is us actually collaborating effectively, you know, from a standpoint of how and why are we not bringing in apprentices? Why are we asking for people with four years experience for an entry level job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have to do a better job of that one, which is kind of like we've been doing this one. And then we take a look at the very vendors that are meant to be helping us and keeping us all nice and safe and secure. And well, this is the shit that they're telling us. You know, we have this every single year at RSA and Black Hat and all the other conferences that tell us that you can keep us 100% secure and they can keep us safe from hackers and still using that fucking hoodie. So, you know, any vendor that's doing that, please feel free to do this to them. That's all I'm going to ask nicely. And then we have to look at how many tasers we're going to need. So if you're sitting as a leadership person or as somebody bringing technology into this industry and you have to take a step back and go, how do I determine what's right? You, know, you look at what Ian Amit and Chris Nickerson have done to actually build the CISO series. You look at some of the stuff we're doing over at Wiser and some of the other work that we're doing to try to make sense of this environment because quite honestly, not only have we got alert fatigue and we have got alert fatigue, let's be perfectly honest, because we keep on seeing so many issues and so many challenges in our environment. We see where the security operations center is seeing so many alerts and what happens to those alerts and how many of those alerts get ignored. And we still haven't figured this one out either. We still haven't sat down and gone, hey, it's not an if, it is a when, what are we gonna do about it? How are we going to take a look at our own industry? And again, back to the back to the election, back to the mentality of those three main organizations that run most of the election systems. They're sitting there, they're sitting back on their laurels for the most part. We've had several years of research where we've had problems in those systems and they've done very little to fix them. And so we have to take a look and go, why? And quite honestly, I would argue that most of those companies out there, especially in the election system, are narcissistic. We're led by marketing messages and lawyers, and we'll talk a little bit about the voting lawyers in a minute. But they try to blind us with baubles and with glitter and other shit, rather than actually take a step back and fix some of the simple stuff. We confuse the hell out of our clients with acronyms and product names every single damn day. And there's a new company out there trying to make a difference and building up another acronym. Again, we're sitting down with the crew over at Wiser. We're actually putting together. We have to build a dictionary to help people understand our own bloody language. There's something wrong with that one. And we're out there focusing on making money. And you guys can read this as well as I can. As an attacker and an adversary, we have basically made this a very easy target practice, which kind of brings us to this point. <sighs> All right. So let's take a look at the state of the voting systems. Where are we? What is going on? Um, we are going to kind of, I wouldn't say gloss over the fact that the midterms were a mess because, well, they were a mess. If we wonder how much, what in the hell's name is that? Oh, hang on a second. I can hear a noise in the background. I think I know what it is. Um, and I can't do anything about it, so we'll deal with it. We'll be okay. So let's take a look at uh, what actually happened a little bit in the set. We won't actually ignore all of it, but we'll ignore some of it. So South Carolina, machines were actually changing votes. The calibration issue is what they called it. Um, election issue in the state. 
Uh, in Georgia, you know, voters waiting for time. Michigan voters being turned away from polls because the systems weren't working properly. Um, they had one voting machine in various townships. They had a hundred voting machines that weren't working properly. I mean, if you look at the technical glitches in Arizona, in, in Ohio, in Cincinnati, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are systems that are meant to be put out there looking after our democracy. And yet we can't even get these simple systems running properly and effectively. Not only can we not get them running effectively, we're putting an absolute mishmash and an array of the damn things out all over the place and then hoping that somebody's actually gonna be able to do something with these ones. Um, glitchy systems all over the place. So let's see why they're glitchy. Let's take a step back. We'll start with passwords. Well, let's just start with the easy stuff. Um, welcome to most of the passwords that have been in use with a lot of the systems out there. I mean, we obviously have some very, some very nice complex ones. I mean, uppercase Everest, just in case. Now, by the way, uppercase Everest, well, we'll talk about that in a second. There are some with no passwords. We've obviously got admin, we've got ESS for one of those companies. And then we take a look at, you know, how easy this stuff is. This came out of uh, North Carolina's election systems. This, I mean, we know this industry. Hang on a sec, your phone went off. We know this industry. And we know this industry really, really well. And the industry of the voters is not an unknown one. An unknown one. They've been out there for a while. We've been taking these, piece, these to pieces for a while. And yet they're still putting this out. This was uh, June 2019 that this one came out. Um, you take a look at some of the voter systems now, not much different. And just for a little point of reference, how quickly and how easily those can actually be broken. And obviously, you know, relatively instantaneous. Let's be perfectly honest on these ones. So, you know, uh, one face palm is obviously not enough. Now, if you are wondering how complex that is to break and how complex some of those are to break, um, here we go. Google Foo, uh, you know, channeling a little bit of inner Johnny Long on this one at this point in time. Search for election central menu passwords and hey presto. Now you can actually see exactly how they do their passwords. Well done. Thank you very, very much to uh, the folks there for this one. Now, if you want to expand your Google Foo and you want to do a little bit of open source intelligence research, um, you can start looking for instruction manuals, passwords, config settings, instructions and install ones, support. Support tickets are amazing. They're all over the damn internet where people have tried putting the voting system in and something hasn't worked. So they're like, well, here's the admin password for it. Now, admittedly, in most cases, this requires you to have physical access to the devices, which let's face it, most of you probably will have at some point in time. Um, I think it's been, it's actually somebody sat down and worked out the handful of counties that would need to be exploited in order to change the course of an election. And it is literally a handful. We are not talking about taking over states. We are simply talking about a number of polling stations and it is not a large number. So you fancy the whole vote for none of the above, feel free to research that. You've got the user IDs and passwords and enjoy yourself. Now, Obviously, the software will protect us. You know, it's software, it's there, it's sorted. It's all in one place. We have an amazing DevSecOps community. We're doing a ton of work on it. And the voting systems, yes, they should be thinking about the... No, they're not. The top one is my favorite one. ES and S systems. 670,000 lines of code, 12 languages, and five different platforms. If anybody's listening, you guys... ES and S did not perform an adequate level of analysis, potential exploitable bugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This isn't just my words. This is actually coming out from uh, Micah Sher, PhD student on this one. You know, we take a look at some of the stuff that Georgetown has done and some of the other work that they've done. And we take a look and see what other findings they have. Malicious software running on the machines with little voter detection, forensics, ineffective, memory cards, install software, Physical access can install software in under 60 seconds. Well, we know from our standpoint, it's 68 seconds if it's running Windows 10, let's be perfectly honest. And so this is where we are today. It isn't last week, last month, last year. Actually, it was probably like about a month and a half, two months ago that I actually sat down out in DC and gave her a fairly lengthy version of this lecture. So this is the challenge. 
this is kind of what we're up to and this is where we are sitting now so um this is where it calls for the presidential face palm, I think, at this point in time, because then we take a look and we go, OK, well, you know, there are three companies that are meant to be doing this. They're all fairly responsible. They're all fairly upstanding members of society. They know that they have the votes of several hundred million Americans and it's democracy, you know, that uh, that is that is at at uh, here. And so, um, oh, no, we're, um, we're just going to throw lawyers at this one. So rather than actually fix the problems. They send their lawyers in. Did you see, not a single new set of proposed machines has been certified in the last three years. They're going to throw lawyers at this. So if you even don't like using their systems and you're litigious creating a barrier to competition, so you can't even put another damn system in place because basically they will throw their lawyers at it. They've actually done a bunch of stuff on here where you know, ES and S lost, uh, lost a bid, then threw lawyers at it until the bid changed. I mean, they suck. And by the way, it isn't just them. Dominion and Hart are also under scrutiny and they fail miserably as well. These are the people that are meant to be actually holding on to a democracy on our behalf. And they're securing themselves with Everest and a bunch of lawyers. And that's it. It sucks. So in summary, we don't actually need anybody to hack the ready elections because, you know, we're actually pretty capable of screwing the whole damn thing up ourselves. So where does this actually leave us? Well, you know, there is an argument to say, really, it kind of leaves us here. We don't have the full picture. There is an argument to say that the general population doesn't know, doesn't care. They're blissfully unaware as to what's going on, which basically leaves us in the predatory position that is here. Now, there is an argument also that that actually isn't quite true. And this is why I love what we're doing. And I love the fact that the community over the last several years has stepped up, really stepped up. Like, as in this came out of August 2019, we've had, or the industry has had, the voting village, the voting machines, the opportunity to do panels, the whole systems that are out there. They put a report out on 2019. And by the way, for any of you that are part of this voting village or anybody actually that knows the folks in there, give them a freaking hug when you're allowed to bypass social distancing and say thank you. Because there are four main things that came out of it. Commercially available systems, still vulnerable to attack. We need the paper ballots. We need different ways of doing it. And the infrastructure and supply chain, huge security risks. That's boiling a very, very comprehensive report down to four points. There's vulnerabilities in these systems. And unfortunately, most of the folks don't seem to want to do anything. The voting village in 2019 basically said that there are issues and that there are challenges. And yet at the moment, all we've seen as a response from most of those three organizations is nothing more than lawyers and pretty much their ignorance of the whole system. So the challenge is we have a clue. We, our industry has a clue. Obviously the three protagonists in this have a clue but the population as a whole still seems to be fairly unaware. But the challenge then becomes one of what do we do about it? How do we make a difference? And how do we change things? Well, you know, what have we done traditionally? We being the royal way, well, we blamed people. Let's be perfectly honest. We have uh, picked on the blame dice. For those of you that know this, these are the blame dice. They're actually fantastic and I love them to death. But we've done a really good job. Our industry has done a good job. I'll be honest, I've stood up myself and I've blamed everybody on the internet for a lot of the problems that we have. But what we really haven't done is taken a step back and say, what can we do to change things? And that's kind of where I want to talk about this kind of stuff. And by the way, when we actually take a step back and we look at the interference on elections, we, those of you in the United of the States, are actually the main, the main, uh, adversaries when it comes to voter interference. If you look at the one in the middle, US is currently, if you look at independent studies on who's actually been messing around with elections, the US is actually leading. Russia's catching up. They got 36 interventions. Let's face it, including 2016 and probably what's going to be 2020 as well if we let things carry on as they're going. So what do we do? Why are we in such a mess? Why, why are we sitting here banging the drum? Why are we not able to get people to listen? Why is the industry not effectively listening? And what do we do to change it? 
So for me, we have to take a bit of a step back and we have to look at humans. This isn't a technology chase. This is a human chase. And to do that, let's take a little step back into our life and realize that when we were kids and we were growing up, we were always taught by our parents or our guardians, don't touch the stove or don't touch the kettle because they're hot. What did we do? We touched the ruddy thing. We got ourselves burned and we learned, unfortunately, through a little bit of pain and suffering. So then we fast forward to our youth and we can all relate to something very similar to this, that at the time, <coughs> excuse me, seemed like an amazing idea. It was great. We will go charging off the cliff with the lemmings. We will stick ourselves in a shopping basket and go charging down the road. Seems brilliant until that point in time that you have wrapped yourself around a tree or stuck somewhere or worse. Great until we've experienced pain and suffering. And then we get a little bit further to our adult life and we realize that the only time we actually learn either not to click the link or to do a little bit of due diligence over the aforementioned link is probably when something has happened. And we have to take a step back and go, why is this? And when we look at it, there's some simple math that we have with communications. And the communication math is very simple. I can get into you, I can convince you to do something to me, typically within the first time, be it click an email, get to your network, get to your system, get you to hand me your telephone number or anything else. Yet when it comes to education, when it comes to actually teaching and training people to not do things or to think before they do something, it takes between seven and 20 times. So for those of you that are sitting there with your awareness programs and all you're doing is teaching your people to not click shit and don't send shit once a year, it's going to take you a number of years before you actually get through to people. So again, change our approach to how we deal with this. We need to sit down. We need to take a step back and we go, how do we do something different? How do we become the ones that actually train more effectively? Again, part of the reason I'm hanging out with the crew from Wiser is because we have that ability to basically do the 30, 60, 90 second videos and get you to think about shit quickly and effectively. And we'll do it on a regular basis. So you, we have to change how we engage with people. And the reason for that one is kind of simple. You look at the top passwords, last 12 months. These are the 2020, 2019, 2020 top passwords. One through six is still number one. We have been beating that freaking drum, bashing the dead horse, whatever euphemism you want to use for it, for what, 25 years? And it's still up there. We haven't communicated effectively. Let's be perfectly honest. So we have to change how we approach. We have to change how we collaborate and communicate because really this is security in a nutshell. It's really what it comes down to. That's it. Have a nice day. And this is really for those of you that think you have a perimeter, yet you don't. Put this on your wall. <clears throat> this is how I look at this. We really have to take a step back and go, how do we change? How do we change how we do things? We have to change it because, well, let's face it, technology has unfortunately, you know, made it a lot harder for us to try to protect the very people around us because, you know, they'll actually climb over to get so many systems. And then we take a look at the attack vectors that we have to deal with. We take a look at the various systems that we have to deal with. You look at the healthcare organizations that have had issues. You look at the systems that we have that have had issues. And you look at the amount of organizations that have been affected. And the reason I chuck this one in here is because we've changed. If we take a look back as an industry, up till recently, when we screwed up, we affected computers, we affected data, we affected systems. We affected maybe voting systems, but now when we screw up, unfortunately, when we get it wrong, people are going to suffer. And if you look at it logically, you know, we talked about this. I gave a LinkedIn post out about this the other day. We talk about the, the difference between humans and our digital world. And Ryan Kilcher, um, amazing guy who we do the podcast with, said it, said it perfectly, which is we are analog humans in the digital world we hand out telephones to our kids without thinking about the consequences of those phones. 
we use technology without thinking about it. We embed technology into humans. We have heart monitors, we have insulin pumps, we have bio and nanotech devices, we have pills that have user IDs and passwords of admin admin going through our systems, taking photographs of our internals. And yet we don't think about the consequences of the technology and how we have to deal with that technology. And we have an entire voting architecture that's you know reliant on uppercase Everest as passwords. So unfortunately, you know, when we get it wrong this day and age and go forward, when we're messing it up now, bad things happen. I mean, it's as simple as that. Now, will artificial intelligence solve us and save us, I should say? Um, this is iRobot's artificial intelligence in action. That is actually my freaking Roomba, one of the Roombas. We've got three in the house. One pretty much so always eats that part of the carpet and gets stuck under there no matter what I do. One typically ends up lost and whining away to itself, probably before one of the dogs tries to eat it. And the other one typically hides under the sofa. This is not artificial intelligence working effectively. So, um, you know, nice short way of looking at it. Artificial intelligence is not going to save us. I'm actually working with uh, an AI company, uh, Calypso, um, doing some amazing stuff on actually how do we hold the industry accountable for artificial intelligence? In other words, how do we measure it effectively? How do we put a yardstick by it? And how do we help companies understand what it is and what it isn't and what it should and shouldn't do? So if we take a step back and we realize the voting system is broken, that the organizations aren't listening, that AI and computers and machines won't save us, and let's be perfectly honest, we're kind of screwed. What do we do about it? How do we change? How do we do something different? And to me, it comes down to this. We have to communicate and collaborate more effectively. So let's talk about the four C's. Communication, we really have to do a better job of exchanging ideas with each other. We have to cooperate more effectively. And this really comes into, if you think about it, Here's one of my biggest challenges, and we'll talk about this in a little second. We all understand the issues and problems that we are actually facing, but we're not good at sharing the information behind that. Um, there's a tinkerers group that I'm part of, and we are good. There are some amazing conversations that happen in there. Um, we're going through a little bit of hand wringing and uh, I think self-realization because I put a post out about grooming in the industry. And this was one of those situations where I got to a point where I'm like, I can't sit and watch this anymore. So I hit the tinkerers group and I'm like, hey, we have to figure out how to solve this problem. We have to look at how there is a safe space for people to report that there are problems with others in this industry. Um, and so we're working that one out. And that is basically breaking this down. This is communication. How do we share ideas? How do we cooperate and how do we coordinate? In other words, one of the biggest or one of the challenges I see in this industry is we're so fragmented. I want to buy a firewall. I've got 50 different choices because nobody actually wants to work with somebody else and build one product better. I have so many people that I see that are like, oh, I'm going to start up a nonprofit or I'm going to start this up. I'm like, why not work with one? Why not go to work with EFF? Why not do work with Innocent Lives Foundation? Why not do work, you know, pick your choice? Rather than starting another one and fragmenting stuff further, why, not, why don't we collaborate and coordinate more effectively? And then collaboration. We see some of this. You know, the voting village was an amazing example, especially in this one. But the voting village has now trying to do what it can with the industry. The challenge is, the industry's got to listen and there's some issues there and sometimes they're not going to listen until it's too late. Um, you know, we had that with aviation, let's be perfectly honest. But I think, again, we as an industry need to change how we actually do this. And so here's the logic on this one. You know, we as practitioners in security, we have a lot of weapons at our disposal. Let's be honest, we have Cali, you know, and if we look at Cali, it's it's not exactly the ideal you know, way to go forward to a company. Hi, I'm going to bring in a piece of software that represents death and destruction. Loves, hugs, and kisses your security partner. Our language is so screwed up. We have ponies and pineapples. We love them. They're amazing technology. But when you walk into leadership and you're like, hi, I'm going to bring a pony and a pineapple in and I'm going to break into you. And they're like, what the f are you going to do to me? 
here's my weapon of choice. And not necessarily coffee. I mean, I have my tea, let's be perfectly honest. Tea and biscuits, coffee and donuts, the best weapons of choice. And the reason for that one is it almost forces collaboration and cooperation. I've walked into, as probably have many of us, into situations where the network team doesn't want to talk to the security team or nobody wants to talk to the developers. The DBAs are stuck in a room because they're like odd anyway. And nobody understands the freaking data scientists. So you have a fractured and a fragmented IT department that doesn't like each other, yet you're all meant to be facing in the same direction and rowing together. Here's my call out. We, the security practitioners, need to be the ones coming to the table of the network team, of the developers with coffee and freaking donuts and sitting down with them and going, how can I help you? Not how can I get in the way? What can I do to stop you? And yet, you know what? They're not going to be happy because we spent 20 years beating the crap out of them. Let's be perfectly honest. So it probably will take a little bit more than coffee and donuts, but that's a good freaking start. But we have to do a better job of actually reaching out and going, how can we solve this together? Because again, we'll go back to the voting systems and the voting machines. When we take a look at those at a software level, at a system level, at an architecture level, some of that is DevSecOps. Some of that would be solved if inside those organizations, those three teams worked effectively together or if we could somehow influence those teams to work effectively together rather than beating on the door and getting beaten down by lawyers. So not only do we have to choose our weapons more effectively, we have to look at the attack vectors and go, what can we do better or what can we do differently to attack the problem? Here's a thought. So Randall Munro has done some amazing books. For those of you that are not sure, this is XKCD's brains behind the whole thing. We need to talk in a language everybody else understands. Again, I'll go back to the wisenry, the compendium that we've put together inside uh, online. And I put a post out about it, I think late last week over the weekend or something. We built a freaking dictionary that goes from geek to English. Actually it goes Greek to geek to English, but that's a different discussion. There's... 40, 50, 60 terms out there. I've got another 200 plus that I'll be putting up there. Eventually, it'll probably be fairly long and extensive. It's still going to be sarcastic, but it'll break things down in the same way that this thing explainer does. We have to make our language more understandable for everybody around us. So anyway, we're going to change things. This is the other one. We're going to ask more questions. We have to. Not only do we have to ask more questions, we have to get the business to ask more questions and the users. If you really think about it, you talk about education and we talk about how do we actually change what we're doing in this society, in this world, it comes down to simply educating people to ask one more question. That's it. My lasting legacy, all I want is people to ask one more question. And the logic is simple. How many times have you heard about people getting scammed because they got an email coming in or a message coming into the system saying, hey, I'm out in Outer Mongolia, your great grandfather's died, I've got money sitting in the bank, nobody's claimed it, would you like some of it? People get taken in by that, just the same as you get an email from the director of the FBI telling you that you need to send him 100, 100 prepaid credit cards. Take a step back and put that, as Ryan again, and Ryan and Evan have said, put that into the analog world that we occupy and go, if somebody not came up to your door and knocked on the door and went, hi, I'm the director of the FBI, can you go buy me some credit cards? You'd smack them upside the head and bury them out in the back in the rockery. Or if somebody came up to your door and said, hey, uh, I, got, I, got a, I got a whole stash of money in the trunk of the car, but I can't get in. Can you lend me $400 so that I can go and make a key so that I can get into the trunk of the car that I just parked in your lot? you'd probably shoot them or you'd taser them. Actually, I prefer that you taser them and put it up on YouTube. But we do that in the digital world all the time. We don't stop and ask more questions. Again, consequences and actions and humans and analog. We have to help educate people to just ask another question. Then we look at DevSecOps. 
And it isn't really just DevSecOps. What do I pick on this one? I mean, let's face it, we're doing the ISSA stuff at the moment. This is another organization that looks and fosters collaboration. Helping this, building this, communicating this, stepping into somebody else's shoes. We, you know, we've talked about this. In order to understand somebody, you walk a mile in their shoes. Well, this is that world. You understand that? Understand how dev works? Go sit down with the development team and watch them and listen to them. Do you have to coach it? But you can watch and listen. You understand how operations work and how much they cuss the rest of us out sometimes? Go hang out with them and have them come hang out. Again, entice them with coffee and donuts or freaking free food, whatever it takes. But we have to definitely do something different as far as this goes. Here's the big one or one of the big ones. None of us like admitting we've screwed up. None of us likes being the poster child at all. But better to put your hand up and stop everybody around you from becoming the next victim than to sit there in silence and do nothing. And yes, you might have a lawyer that tells you you can't go out there and tell people that you just got your ass handed to you because of an exploit on whatever it might be. But this is why we have a community. This is why we have Signal. This is why we have the Tinkerers group or back channels. This is why we have ISSA. This is why we have the ISACs. Because we have the ability to communicate behind the scenes to help everybody around us. I'm part of a, a group, um, part of a WhatsApp channel out of, uh, out of the Middle East. And it's fantastic for me because those teams collaborate and they're across all the countries in the Middle East. And they listen to each other. And when one gets hit, they put a hand up and go, hey, this is what's going on. It's all back channel communications, but what it does is it stops the bleeding or at least it slows it down. Because as an attacker, if I have an exploit and I can run it in company number one and it works, I'm gonna try to run it in 10 other companies in the same freaking vertical or around you. And if you put your hand up and you go, I just got my ass handed to me, shit just happened, here's what happened, here's what to look out for, all of a sudden those exploits don't work everywhere. And we communicate and collaborate more effectively. So, Yes, pay attention to some of the lawyers, but also keep the back channels open, please. So this is the other one. We've forgotten the people. Let's put it this way. This is people, process, and technology. We have charged off to the deity that is technology, and we lie prostrate at their altar waiting for something to happen. Shit's not going to get fixed that way. Let's talk about people and process. Let's get the people worked with. I mean, we got two options. We can ignore the people and hope the machines take over. That might take a while. Or we can spend a bit of time educating the people. We have to look at the process. I don't know how many freaking companies I've gone into where you're like, hey, what framework? And they're like, oh, huh? what processes and policies and procedures you have? And you get this blank stare. Quit that shit. Get some framework in place because then you can measure it. You actually have an effective way of now working with HR, with finance, with legal and compliance. And the frameworks are all out there. And guess what? They're free. You don't have to pay Deloitte and two millions of dollars to get your shit together. You can do most of this yourself. One other thing as part of this one, we talk about collaboration. A penetration test is not collaborating with somebody. You want to do red team, proper red team exercises, go talk to Nickerson and the team. But if you want to actually change your environment, don't start with a freaking pen test. Sit around a table, bring donuts and coffee, and do some tabletop exercises. Bring the people in. Talk about what ifs. Talk about situations. Ask a simple question. How can I shut the company down in the next 24 hours? And all of a sudden, you get a whole bunch of people going, hey, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? You are fostering communication. You are fostering collaboration. 
you are not showing them up in a bad light. So you want to affect change? Don't get a fucking pen test. You want to affect change properly? Go out, do a tabletop exercise, and get some collaboration going. And you can feed and water people at the same time. The Jewish part of me coming out. This one's for us. Most of you will recognize that's my ugly mug, and that is one of my hairy wolf mugs that's sitting there. And the reason this one is for us is we talk about unplugging. The world and the environment that we are in is, let's face it, kind of stressful. A lot of shit going on and not a huge amount of hours to deal with it. And there's some of our own internal demons that we all deal with. And I am probably the pot calling the petal kettle black here because I'm not good at unplugging. In fact, I suck at it, but I have to get better. And the reason is, is I need to look after my mental health and all of you do and all of us do. So this is kind of a shout out for the movement that is going on and being run by some amazing people where we have to talk about the mental health in our industry and how we have to keep an eye on each other much more effectively. So let's start summing some of this up before we run out of time. Um, there is more, you get the idea. We have a lot to change and a lot of it comes down to the human standpoint. You know, We talked about the voting systems for a while, but I think a lot of it, again, it comes down to the people and the process rather than throwing more tech at it. This, I actually had this in for quite a while, not just since we've had all of the people standing up going, why the hell aren't we being counted? But our future has to be different than our past. Well, actually, if we go way back in our past, our industry, let's face it, was fostered and built on by some amazing women. And yet we seem to have lost that for a variety of different reasons. So we need to change and we need to change quickly and effectively. And it is going to take all of us. And it's going to take all of us looking after all of us. Again, back to that grooming thing. There are some people in this industry which are who are predators. We know who they are. We know the companies that they either work for, or in one case, the two companies that they run. And that needs to change. Because irrespective of who you are, anything to do with you, it's going to take all of us in this industry to affect that change. It's going to take all of us looking after each one in this industry to affect change. It's going to take all of us working together to do something differently. And it's going to take all of our ideas as well. All right, so some final thoughts before I uh, wrap it up and we get back to some questions or whatever else we want to talk about. <coughs> all right, quit blaming everybody else. Quit it. Stop the shit. Stop blaming anybody for breaking in. Stop blaming everybody else. Look in the bloody mirror. If your ass got handed to you inside your company, the chances are it got handed to you for a reason because you didn't fix the basics or you were focused elsewhere or you were chasing the next APT or somebody bought the shiny shit from RSA because the vendor offered them a free golfing lesson. Quit that shit. Get back to basics. Fix the fundamental stuff change communication, change the collaboration model, and start looking in the mirror. We've only got ourselves to blame. If you're sitting there bitching about the network team or bitching about the database team, it's just as much your fucking fault as it did everybody else's. It takes two to tango. So change yourself, change how our attitudes look, start looking in the mirror, and stop blaming China and North Korea and everybody else for all of our woes. All right, almost the final slide. We've all approached this from different directions. Let's be perfectly honest. I mean, we've all come at this from different areas, different realms, different work. We've all come into this industry from a different perspective, or hopefully from a different perspective, but we're all in this together. So we have to be the ones that affect change. We have to be the ones that actually succeed because as individuals, we're gonna fail. It isn't gonna work. It doesn't matter how much I stand up and how much I bitch and scream and how much I tell the voting industry they suck, or how many times I put the passwords up on LinkedIn or whatever, or Twitter, or I sell them to somebody. It doesn't mean a damn thing if it's just one person. Same thing with the, with the aviation industry. It took the entire industry a very rude awakening and a very blunt awakening for them to go, oh shit, they actually mean business. We're going to have to do something similar with the voting industry. It's going to take us all. So stand up, take a stance, and effect change. All right. With that, thank you. 
thank you to everybody listening. Thank you to the ISSA folks. And thank you to the Wolfmutt who just stopped back in and slobbered all over my side. So I will shut up and we will see if there's questions or anything that we can do. So I'll stop the share at this point. Thank, thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank, thanks for sharing, Chris. Really appreciate it. Uh, quick question. Have you ever had any type of success uh, speaking to and getting politicians to listen to you? Uh, a little, but not a huge amount of success. Um, I think that's, you know, that's part of the problem. We've had some success, but not a huge amount. I, uh, after I gave the talk over at uh, Dream, Dream, whatever it's called, Dreamport, out in uh, DC, I had a conversation with a couple of the politician type people, but a lot of this and not much of this. Yeah, all, uh, as we used to call it, I don't know if it's an English phrase or an American phrase, but it's all trap and all, uh, all math and no action. Yeah. Um, we have all math and no trousers, I think, is the official one. Um, uh, and I think that's part of the frustration that we have here is, you know, if that communication isn't there or isn't working, it's like who else in the network could do it? Who else is around to do it? Who, who listening in, who around the place could be the one that can actually affect change? Because, again, it can't just be one of us beating the drum. It's got to be a lot of people sitting there. You know, perfect example. I mean, ESS has got so many freaking lawyers, it's ridiculous. So if that's the case, how do you affect change differently? Do you invite their technical team to the DevSecOps conferences? I mean, that'd be a fantastic way of doing it. You know, who around here can affect change within any of their organizations? I think that's, you know, this. there are numerous ways of skinning that particular cat. So we together have to find a better way of dealing with this. Um, here's a good question from Don. Uh, what back channels do you like or use most? Um, I have, uh, so I have a couple. I, I actually really love Signal. Um, I have a number of groups that sitting on Signal, but I also have a bunch of stuff sitting on Slack. Um, I'm, we're obviously careful on what gets, what gets said on Slack. Um, but the aviation, perfect example, the aviation, it ended up going to DHS. So that was the ISACA, but it was uh, NCIX. So DHS took that over. And then for a couple of years, they started releasing stuff and doing their own research. But that was what was most effective there. Um, for a lot of the stuff to do with uh, some of the grooming stuff we were talking about and using the Tinkerers group, you know, there's conversations going on in there, mostly about how to approach it properly. Because, I mean, I would take my approach, which is I would approach the individual, which has actually happened already, and I just kneecap them. I I'm not a nice person. I will kneecap them and I'll go bury them in the desert, and that just solves the problem. But it doesn't provide a safe space for people to stand up, which is what we need to do as well. Don also wants to set of those blame dice. Yeah, those are blame dice. Where does he get those? Uh, he asks, uh, get him to hit me up nicely and I will get him in touch with the person that makes the aforementioned blame dice and we go from there. And um, they're actually made, there's an amazing individual who makes them like a seriously freaking awesome person who makes them. Uh, being that the current election machine manufacturers has such a strong foothold, we won't ask why. Is there a way? <laughs> that Hold on to money. Let's face it. Yeah, follow the money. Is there a way that they can be better? Are those companies fixable at this point? I think they are if they're willing to listen. But the problem is, there's no incentive for them to listen. Right. You know, I think that's that's the challenge is, you know, yes, you've got four senators who have said, hey, the election system's broken, but the countless rest, I mean, that's a small voice. You need more than that. Or quite honestly, what needs to happen is on election night, vote for none of the above needs to, needs to literally be trending. And you're like, huh, wonder how that happened. I mean, you know, again, this comes back to human nature. And human nature is we don't do something unless it's too late. And we're seeing this already, you know, it's, we've seen it, we keep seeing it. And I'm doing a bunch of research in the transportation industry. And quite honestly, my attitude at the moment is how many people do I have to kill before you pay attention? Okay. So um, Bill wants to know what we can do to help with the voting issues. I think we, I think it's raised the issue. Talk to the voting village people. Actually, you know, I mean, you, you already said it. Talk to the politicians. I mean, if anything, talk to the local senator, talk to people in power, look at the network that you have, see who you're connected to. 
um, raise the awareness. Go out there, do some research. Look at the Voting Village research, do your own research and publish it. The more people that get out there, the more voices that we have in the industry, people putting stuff on LinkedIn, on Twitter, oh hell, I don't, I mean, for those of you that use Twitch streams and all that kind of shenanigans, do a live. Hey, here's how I hacked the voting machine that's going to be installed down the road in a month's time. Here's how quickly I got into it. Here's how I changed things. You know, stuff, I'd raise the awareness. All right, here's a deep question for you. They want to know if you're a ventriloquist because you were drinking water, but yet there was no pause in the talking. How did you do that? <laughs> I can breathe underwater. We'll just talk about that one. No, okay. Oh, he's going to do it now. Oh, you should have kept talking there. I know, I go to be fun. No, we'll mess around a little bit. Yeah, no, I, um, yeah, I can recycle, I can recycle breathing. Um, part of my background in the military was doing all sorts of interesting, stupid shit underwater. We'll just leave it at that. Cool. So what groups do you recommend for those of us who stand up and ask questions? Um, insofar as what? I mean, I, in, what, in what way? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that they're looking for other recommendations to some of the things that you participate in. Oh, so I mean, the B-Sides, B-Sides community is good. The, the voting village is, is absolutely amazing. I mean, I got, I got so much love. For, oh, hey, I just saw, I just saw questions. Oh, there we go. Um, I'll let you take over with the questions then. I'm yeah, I, I was looking at the wrong screen. It was hidden behind the other screen. Sure. So the groups is a tough one. I, I don't have a huge amount of recommendations, partly because I squirrel. I mean, the voting stuff is what I've been messing around with a lot. But I've been, I mean, that machine behind me is, is the one I'm using to actually work with EEG. So I'm all over the place with stuff I mess around with. Um, uh, I would say there's, uh, hit the voting village, hit the forums behind that one would be a good start on that one. Um, do a little bit of research as to who else is, is hitting that side of the world. Um, I don't know. I mean, the groups I follow are, I mean, I've got about a dozen Slack channels and four or five Teams channels that I work. 971 Seconds is an amazing group of folks. Obviously, 303 is, is 303. I mean, 841. Um, you've got Pacific Northwest hackers. I mean, talk about some amazing freaking people out there. Um, Pacific Northwest, huge shout out to those folks. There's some like really freaking amazing people. So I don't know. Groups of people discussing and digging into things. Oh, there we go. Yeah, um, I have some. Hit me up offline. It's probably the easiest way of dealing with that one. You want to grab one of those others that you see on the screen? Uh, the apparent evidence that millions of people have been hacked. Um, I haven't looked at Chris's stuff as far as that one. Um, do I understand that millions have been hacked? Well, yeah, I mean, let's face it. I think we're sitting on... What are we sitting on with user accounts? I think we're sitting on about 19, 18 or 19 billion user accounts and user IDs and passwords for various people around the globe that we have, that we feed that into, like have I been pwned in a bunch of other places. I mean, you know, you want to take a look at it that way. Yes, you know, everybody's susceptible. Everybody's lost their data. Um, it just depends on what they're doing with it. I mean, let's be perfectly honest. How do you clean up the voting nightmare? <sighs> I don't clean up the voting nightmare. I think this is a wee thing. Again, I think it comes to more voices. More people, I mean, think about it. If, you, if all the SNS is going to do and all the other folks are going to do is throw lawyers at the problem, then to me, it's like, let's make them throw more and more lawyers at it. Let's play the whack-a-mole thing because we need more and more people to actually sit down and say these things. We need more and more people. It shouldn't just be, you know, ESNS. It should be everybody focuses on it. Literally, what I would love to see is a whole bunch of flipping videos of people breaking this shit, to be perfectly honest. What I would really, really love to see would be, you know, hey, here's Dominion system, here's Heart system, here's the ESS. Hey, I know the ones that the, or even just start posting shit up on LinkedIn and on, on the tubes, on the social media about like how, the more people that have a voice, the more people are gonna listen. That's really how I look at it. I don't have all the answers. I mean, that's the one big thing. This is you know, with the grooming thing that went on with this particular individual and as an industry, the grooming stuff. I, I, I know how I would solve it and it's probably not the nicest way to solve it and it's probably not the right way to solve it, which is why I went to the Tinkerers group and I'm like, I need help. I have a problem, I have an issue. I know my way of solving it is nasty, grumpy and would solve the problem, but it's not the best way. How do we make it more effective that it can be repeatable? And that's why there's a group of people. and. For me, the Tinkerers group is an amazing group of individuals, um, mostly leaders in the industry, 
but there are other groups out there. There's a bunch of stuff, obviously, you know, the DEF CON forums, the B sites forums are just freaking out of this world in some cases. I mean, uh, we're doing a bunch of stuff. Sempris is starting up a research community. Um, I'm hanging out with the Sempris crew a bunch and we're starting up a research community in all things to do with like um, identity management and uh, Active Directory. So hit me up on that one. If, if anybody out there is listening, has a bent or an interest in like AD stuff or identity management or actually looking at how we change that. So I would, um, I would totally hit that one. Now, considering your background, Chris, uh, where you come from, uh, do you think that the, a third of America is basically suffering from King syndrome where they don't mind the hacking because they feel that it's being done by our own government to ensure the right person's getting elected? You want to talk oh, about yeah, that's a real interesting one on that one. Um, uh, you know, I, so here's the interesting from my background and from how I look at it. All I want is a fair fight. You know, I, you know, the UK system, I mean, no system is, but yeah, that's it. I want a fair fight. Quite honestly, I kind of want communism, but that's an entirely separate discussion. Because if, I mean, think about it. Think about it logically. If we actually had, like the, the, the Jewish, the kibbutz system and the Amish, those systems, if humans cared about each other as much as they care about themselves, those systems would work, but we don't live in that society. We don't live in that world. As humans, we suck. I mean, we're terrible to each other. We're terrible to the world, and we suck at good custodians of society. Um, so those systems will fail. So if that system is going to fail, then quite simply, I want one thing. I want one person to have one vote, and I want that vote to count. I want it to count properly, and I want it to be the vote that you cast on the machine or in the ballot to be the one that actually gets counted for or against the individual. That's it. I mean, talk about a simple freaking theory. You put a tick in a fucking box and that tick in the box stays there no matter what. It doesn't get adjusted because of errors. It doesn't have to go through the electoral college where, well, you know, I kind of probably have to vote with the people, but I'm not going to. I mean, stupid shit like that just I, I, it defies and beggars belief to be perfectly honest. And then we throw technology at it and all hell breaks loose. Uh, here's last question, and they got it in just under the wire. Are there, <laughs> are, there, are there any standards for voting that states should adopt beyond AppSec? Some states check signatures to the voting roll, display paper votes, others don't. Others don't, yeah. I mean, again, it's all over the place, and it shouldn't be. You know, it's, it shouldn't be. And, and I think this is part of the, pro this is part of the issue, so... Um, yes, I have looked at the open source voting system that's used in California. Um, some of California have actually looked at that one. Um, yeah, I, I think we should have some better standards and I think everybody should be held accountable. And quite honestly, I think a lot of those standards needs to come from our industry because, or at least we can collaborate on those standards. It shouldn't be a government led effort. It should be something where, you know, we have a seat at the table, the villain, you know, the, the voting companies have a seat at the table government and industry and just the end person the person in the street's got a seat at the freaking table too because at the end of the day that's who it, that's who we're meant to be protecting that's it i mean at the end of the day our job is to protect and we're not doing a good job of it let's be honest well i want to thank you chris um no, do you, have, do you have a drink of choice if i may ask Ooh, typically, uh more often than not if it's if it's a good whiskey then it's typically an isla I do like my slightly uh, meatier whiskeys, shall we say, something that's got a little bit more life to it. Um, but if it's so, uh, yeah, I mean, normally like an Ardbeg or Kawila or something along those lines or a Brooklyn Attic or, you know, there are some massive amazing ones out there. Now you flip that around. If we're talking beer, I have one, we can call it simple rule. I have one very simple rule for beer. If it emits light, I'm not going to drink it. <laughs> I'll agree with you on that. Yeah. If I can stand a spoon up in it, then we're in good shape. Then it, I know it's got nutrients. It's got nutrient value. It's got nutrients in it. It's good for me. And I can't see freaking light through it. Then, then I'm in good shape. Are you talking about meat or beer? No, this is beer. This is uh, now meat is different. Yeah. Meat is different. Obviously that's a lighter thing. Meat is good. No, this is beer. Okay. This is, I need to be able to pour it. It needs to be basically motor oil. Let's with flavor. 
Excellent. But, uh, all right. So when this whole crazy COVID thing's over, you and I have uh, have to go and check out some of those delicious liquids. Yeah, I'm totally up for it. I've still got some left in the lab space here. You know, it's less than it was, but it is what it is. Well, listen, from all of ISSA, LA, all of the Southern California community and all the people that are watching, because we've got people from around the country uh, that have joined us today, I want to thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. Um, let's hope for the best. Doesn't look very bright, uh, particularly for this November, but... yeah. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Again, thanks for everybody listening. Uh, you know, Rich, I know I'm a little scatterbrained, shall we say, when it was organizing it, but thanks. And Josh, thanks for keeping an eye on us on the tech stuff. Much appreciated. All right. Stay safe, my friend. Yeah, you too. And everybody listening, stay safe, stay healthy.